Welcome to the Train Like a King podcast, dedicated to all things paddling, designed to help paddlers of all levels get motivated to get out on the water. Tune in, grab your paddle, and let's train like a king. Kia ora guys, and welcome back to another Train Like a King podcast episode. On this episode, I'm going to be recapping a bit of the Hawaii Nui Va'a 2023. More specifically, my experience with Kalahui Kai for the third time. Um, first off, I just want to say, you know, it was an awesome experience, uh, especially to race another Hawaii Nui with um, my Hawaiian based team, Kalahui Kai. A big thank you to Alan Fluger for giving me the, yet another opportunity to, to be the best that we can be on the water as a team, especially at the biggest va'a race in the world. So, you know, months of anticipation and preparation goes into preparing for an event like this. You know, logistically, it's one of the hardest races to do. Um, not just, you know, physically, it's not just physically a hard race, but, you know, organizing canoes transportation getting to the islands and food and everything there's a lot to it that goes towards the hawaii nui so um again big thank you to alan kala Kai for for providing us the foundation to 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 be able to perform race at this event um despite having limited time with my team in the lead up to to this event i wasn't i wasn't able to get over for as many races this year as i would have liked to with kalahui kai pre hawaii nui so, uh, molokai hoi was cancelled and the i had a race in brazil the same time as the catalina which i normally go and race with uh, kalahui kai for so i didn't get a lot of lead up time to this event however you know after you've spent a few years with with your team with a particular team racing with uh same guys you know the easier it gets to to come together and um and race together even though it was less than a week that i had to you know to to blend and prepare with the boys before hawaii Nui, it was still still a really good um uh team that we had um fortunately the rest of the team had a great lead into the Hawaii Nui, um, you know, so we had one of our strongest teams all around and um, to put forward for this race. You know, several key factors that contribute to success in the Hawaii Nui race itself is, a, is there's a series of things like there's a lot, but I'm going to name some of the key ones. One, physical preparation, for sure, that plays a major part. But on top of physical, just your actual blend of the team is really important. So time together, working together, you know, this is key to six man paddling. And then also even more specific to Hawaii Nui and all of its stages, just the knowledge and experience of the, the specific race conditions and what, what to expect in a race is really important as well. So having a lot of exp experience in, in the canoe helps experienced steersmen, paddlers, you know, cause they know what to expect and they've gone through the hurdles and the, the tough moments and, and things like that. That's, that's pretty priceless. So this was actually my seventh Hawaii Nui. Um, I think the first four was with Paddling Connection and then three, the last three with Kala Hui Kai. So very very happy to you know be able to even have just done one hawaii canoe but to say i've been able to do seven had the privilege to race seven it's pretty amazing so yeah um so i'm just going to recap a few of the days and the dates leading into race day and then i'll go into each stage more specifically so on october the 28th I arrived from Tahiti, from New Zealand, and at the same time, the rest of Kalahui Kai arrived from Hawaii 
So we arrived about 10 p.m. at night and we were lucky enough to stay with Te Moana Taputu's family, Tati Glo, and we're always greeted with, you know, the the most uh, heartwarming welcomes and the most amazing food, including including poisson cru, which is the raw fish of Tahiti. Um, it's yeah, I I I rate them as some of the uh, well, they are the best cooks in Tahiti. So we're always very happy to be at the at their place and also the um, more personally the Duse family's place because they have the best cooks in Tahiti, hands down. So. Um, we stayed there the night and then the next day on October the 29th, um, we, we got up, had coffee, breakfast, and we actually, because we didn't have a lot of time, we decided to go for a team jog to the OPT complex because they have a little field there. And, um, we played some beach soccer, some, um, beach, beach soccer, which is, uh, a common activity for paddling teams to to partake in because not only is a little bit of it's cardio and you know a bit of physical activity but it's also fun and it's kind of like um brings the morale of the team up you know it's it's a, it's a good way to to bond with your team and so we did that before we took our flight to Huine at around 2 30 p.m um, and we, when we arrived to Huahine, we stay with Sophie and her family at her amazing beachside home. Um, she's always very welcoming too, and we we get spoiled with with food there, and yeah, just just the kindness and the ability to host, you know, over twelve of us paddlers and coaches and team is just amazing so big thank you to sophie and her family for taking care of us not just this year but previous years on the 30th of october we enjoyed more food um even got the privilege of having pancakes banana pancakes for breakfast eggs and things but this day was the official canoe weighing day so your canoe has to be a minimum of 150 kgs so if it's less than that you have to put weight in so we got our canoe weighed and we rigged it up for the first time um, and then we went out for a little 30 minute blending session just with a few sprints and starts tied on to the end um, in the afternoon a few of us went for a light 45 minute jog uh, this was probably more so to calm nerves than anything because you know you start to you feel like you're not doing enough, but you probably should just rest anyway, but you're, you're kind of eating a lot cause you're preparing for the race, but you, you kind of want to burn some energy as well. So, um, we went for a light jog still, um, two days out from first day. Um, so yeah, we did that. And then October 31st. So the day before the first race day, um, we prepared the canoe further for race day, um, including putting on the race stickers, you know, setting up our drink systems, making any last adjustments to the rigging. We also registered for the race, which required all of our IDs. And then bracelets were given to the starting six padlets um, because between each day, you have to get your, your bracelet cut off and put on to the next padlet if you're changing and so forth. So that's the system that they do there. Um, we did one more paddle that day too. This is one day before the race day with Pia because he had just arrived that day and we wanted to test our, our first day combo combination. So we did a, another little 30 minute paddle, but this time we headed up and a little bit into the headwind, turned around and surf, surfed home just to practice a little bit of our feeling. And then went home and, and fueled up, um, again at Sophie's. So, um, November 1st, stage one of the Hawaii Nui Va'a, Huahine to Raiatea, which is about 48, uh, kilometers, I believe, or 46 or something like that, around that 48 kilometers. 
So the lineup for that day was one, Hunter, myself, Paya, Kala, Kaihe, and Tuarongo. Now, the wind was actually really good for stage one. So the reason I say that is because it was relatively straight compared to previous years. It was still a challenging angle because it was slightly from the left, which is which is kind of natural for that for that wind. But to put it in perspective, compared to last year, um, times were at least 40 minutes faster than they were last year because last year's wind was real side wind from the right hand side. This year was more straight, but it was a little bit from the left. So it was still a little bit difficult, but um, we had a really good start and avoided a lot of mishaps. Um, especially around the turning boys. We spotted a lot of other canoes like yeah, Tahiti got caught on the buoy and stuff like that. So we were pretty happy to get through unscathed. Um, and we found really good rhythm in the surf. We surfed well, and I think our line was pretty good too. But, you know, throughout the, throughout the race, you always go through tough patches, um, as you do. And Sometimes you're not sure if it's like our energy levels or if it's just a really strong bit of current or, you know, we might be, might be tacking against the surf a little bit to, to improve our line or something like that. So, you know, there's moments of tough uh, struggles in, in the race, but then there's moments where you just start surfing and connecting and having fun. So um, personally, the only minor problem that I had during the race was probably in the last like few kilometers where we entered the past we made it to the past of Rayatia and as soon as we got in I actually started cramping um so I was starting to get cramping in my elbows and even in my core in my upper core abdomen and then even a little bit of my chest so I had to quickly take a gel and some fluids to to prevent that from happening and um luckily you know we didn't really that didn't affect uh, us too much or for too long so we we were able to maintain our position quite comfortably and we finished 10th which we were um pretty happy with always always great to finish in the top 10 um but obviously you always want to aim high aim high you always want to aim for aim to win <laughs> and if you fall short then that's 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 just racing so um but yeah happy with our top 10 placing unfortunately um on this day we lost our friend and champion kevin quida um he started the race with his brother steve tehiltata and team pide but was removed from the canoe um quite early i think in the first 10 minutes due to a, a health event and um, unfortunately, he passed away later on that that night. Um, so our thoughts, you know, and our prayers continue to be with him and his family. Um, in in Maori Maori cosmology or Maori culture, uh, we always reference the the word Hawaii, which is quite ironic because we're doing a race called the Hawaii Nui. And Hawaii refers to the legendary homeland and ancestral origin of Maori people and other Poly Polynesian cultures. Um, to us, it's like the spiritual realm, realm, a mythical place from where uh, our cultures originated, and it holds great significance in in Maori mythology because it was basically the place that we came from, you know. But it's also the place that uh, we believe is where spirits return to after death, representing both the origin of life and the final destination. So um, without a doubt, you know, that day marked the beginning of um, Kevin's final journey to the land of Hawaii. So, um, yeah, so moving on to stage two of the Hawaii Nui on November the 2nd. So this race is Raiatea to Taha. So this is one of the shortest races, 26 kilometers, 
or there or thereabouts. I always forget. But it's also one of the hardest because of how hot it can get and how intense it is. So, yeah, it's there's a there's always a chance that you're going to some teams are going to finish with with uh with pretty you know high likelihood of heat stroke and stuff like that because of how tough this race is. Um the lineup for this day was Tristan Riley, Kekoa, Keith, Kai here for his second course, and then Travis Grant steering. Now, the day was um, was challenging for everyone because, you know, after the loss of Kevin Quida, um, but to honor his memory, I think Viper Va'a or Alex from Viper um, made some stickers for Kevin that um, everyone could put on their canoe in support of Kevin you know, to motivate everyone to race hard, you know, with his name on, on the canoe. Um, so, but yeah, so we made some changes on day two. We switched out five paddlers, keeping Kaihe in for his final leg of the week. Um, you know, he already had raced day one. So, um, I think he, he knew that this was likely going to be his, his last one. Um, and despite, you know, the, 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 the sad moment with Kevin. Um, most teams were able to push through, um, you know, with the motivation of Kevin behind us. So the boys had a strong start um, and they were kind of consistently around the top 15. Um, but the major test for day two is dealing with the intense boat wake um, created by support boats, mostly coming or mostly traveling on the left side. So the wave comes on the armor side, so it makes it quite difficult to navigate because it's quite tippy. And um, but I think Travis Grant, even though he hasn't steered that day, he did quite well and um, had good judgment in where to place the canoe. Because if you're too close to the boats, the weight can get quite chaotic and quite hard to control. But if you're too far away and you're close to the land, then you, you kind of don't maximize your surfing opportunities. Um, but I would, I would say Travis kind of went right in the middle of both. And so he kind of got the best of both worlds. Um, overall at the end of the day, the boys maintained 11th place in the general rankings for the day, which was awesome, you know, so only to, you know, Day one were tenth of general, and then day two were eleventh general. So that was a really good effort by the boys, and um, we were pretty stoked to come out unscathed. You know, canoe was all good, and yeah, no damage, no damage inflicted. Um, we during our during the races, you know, after race one, we stayed on catamarans. So, um pretty awesome way to 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 see the islands to race and recover between legs um chilling out on the catamaran eating and, and um, enjoying each other's company so it's thought of worth note noting that there so now we move on to stage three november the third the last leg of the hawaii nui taha to bora bora this race was a little bit longer than normal because of a slightly different finish route so it was about 60 kilometers in the end. And for this lineup, we had Tristan at one, Paya two, me three, Keith four, Hunter five, and Tuorongo six. So this is the biggest and the longest day of all of the three races. And it's the final battle to Bora Bora. Um, despite the, challenge, the challenges, um, you know, we, I guess, Despite the challenging, I guess, uh, decisions on the final team, um, you know, we were able to push through as a team and work for each other. Um, unfortunately, our day took a difficult turn quite early on in the race. So right at the start, um, we, f we found ourselves wedged between uh, two canoes on our left, which caused us to collide with the current leaders, Shalva. 
and while their their canoe was all good our arm had suffered a significant crack in the carbon and at about the 25 kilometer mark you know not only did we were we did, like by the time we got going again we were close to the close to the back of the pack shell were able to make their way back towards the front as shell do but um it was quite hard hard work for us to get back to you know that top 15 top 10 and at, a, at the 25k mark we actually felt really heavy especially our armor was was kind of submerging itself in the water um, indicating that it was taking on water so we actually ended up having to change our armor mid race and this actually took and I, I i looked at my garmin data after the race this actually took ten, uh, like upwards of 10 minutes just purely stopped in a channel floating in in the water um for us to it took us that long to change to change armors so you can imagine how many teams passed us um in that 10 10 minutes however once we changed the armor man straight away we noticed the the difference and our our canoe just started surfing um and we actually had a really really good end to the race so considering the setback um you know we managed to oh, i don't even know how many teams we passed in the end but we we pushed hard all the way to the finish in Bora Bora and we managed to finish 17th place in the end despite that 10 minute um setback and you know our general ranking actually remained 15th place overall so we finished 15th overall in the Hawaii canoe despite that last um armor incident and yeah you know just crossing the finish line on the beaches white sand beaches of Bora Bora surrounded by people support boats um, everyone cheering you on you know that's just a, a surreal experience like that's the it's pretty pretty amazing you know when you're exhausted and you've put put everything on the line you've given everything body and mind you know it's um it's pretty awesome to cross that finish line and and have it over and done with um you know it's those moments that make uh that uh, the challenge of the hawaii well worth it um so ultimately opt actually ended up winning overall you know so shell faced some difficulties during the race i can't help but think that maybe the collision with us um contributed to that a little bit maybe they had to work a little bit harder to get back to the front um and you know they ended up having to only finish with five paddlers in the end because they had a couple of trouble bit of trouble with two of their paddlers so um big congratulations to opt super stoked for te Moana and the boys kiahi uh, mark air you know really close with those boys in there they're a young team so it's cool to see a new generation new champs first time opt has won the hawaii canoe in 13 years I, I i believe 2010 was the last so it's cool and it's i mean it's almost it, it works in cycles really so congratulations to opt um for their for their overall win of the hawaii canoe um <laughs> The way that I, the way that I want to finish this episode is just finishing with a few words um, for Kevin Quida, you know, our friend um, who you know sadly passed away uh, during this race. So um, I prepared this little part, you know. So our friend Kevin Quida had completed his journey, reaching his ultimate destination, Bora Bora. This mark. This marked more than just the end of a race. It was his final resting place where he found peace and tranquility. As we continued our race, Kevin's pres presence lingered, reminding of us, reminding us of the fragility of life and the strength of the human spirit. 
His journey to the land of Hawaii was not just a somber farewell, but a testament to the enduring spirit of the human soul. In the waters of Bora Bora, Kevin found eternal rest, becoming part of the very essence of the island, forever woven into the tapestry of legends and stories. Inspired by his spirit, we pushed forward with unwavering determination, just as he had. Yeah, you. Um, ride in peace, Kevin Quita. Um, that was for you. And thank you all for listening to this episode um, recapping the Hawaii Nui Fa'a Race 2023. And um, we'll catch you on the next one. Kia ora. Thank you for listening to another episode on the Train Like a King podcast. Check out trainlikeaking.com for training plans, merchandise, and coaching opportunities. If you haven't already, give us a follow so you don't miss another episode. Catch you on the next one.